All right, today we're going to talk about the Renaissance period, and this would sometimes is called the Italian Renaissance because it begins there and really focuses on Italy. As we mentioned before, the, uh, the plague hit Italy first in Europe, and therefore the recovery comes to Italy first. By the way, I don't know if you saw this in the news, but there are two or three people in China who just reported having the Black Plague. I don't know if you saw that in the news. So you can Google that, Black Plague China, and it should pop up as a story for you uh, to check on. But, you know, the plague is still around. There, there are reported cases in the United States every year, and there are usually uh, two or three people that die of the Black Plague every year in the United States. So the disease is still around, and uh, it can be treated now. But uh, by the way, uh, those, those cases usually happen in New York, where there's a lot of rats, and there are a lot of four-footed creatures too. No, just kidding. And then it also happens out in, um, <laughs> in the western states where they have prairie dogs. You know what I'm talking about when I say a prairie dog? Prairie dogs uh, also have fleas. Uh, they get fleas, and they have often been carriers of the Black Plague. So, so the people who normally get the Black Plague are people who go camping in Arizona or someplace like that where they have prairie dogs. They're out camping. They get bitten by a flea. Or uh, people in New York who happen to be bitten by a flea, probably in the high-rent district parts of New York. Okay, so it can, it's treatable now with antibiotics, but of course, sometimes it's not recognized since it's pretty rare, and uh, there's at least one or two people every year in the United States that die of it. But famously, now, a couple people in China uh, have contracted it. So it's still around. Well, let's talk about it. After the Black Plague then leaves, or dissipates, I guess I should say, uh, Italy is the one that will uh, recover the first in Western Europe. And of course, they have all the things that are going to be necessary for uh, the Renaissance to take place. Most people see this as uh, a period of, of uh, a great period of history, uh, an amazing period of history with great change. And they often compare it to, say, classical Greece, you know, say in Athens of the 5th century, all the great building, architecture, art, philosophy, all that kind of stuff. You see that here, and I suppose that that relates because it is, a renaissance means rebirth, right? Rebirth of the Greco-Roman values, Greco-Roman uh, art, Greco-Roman culture, that sort of thing. So that's, that's what we see uh, that's going on. And here, by the way, is uh, if you ever get to Florence, you'll definitely see that because that's one of the biggest tourist attractions, but also just a beautiful building, this domed church that you see, the Domo. Um, and that's quite a spectacular building. So there's a lot of spectacular architecture, art, um, and uh, there's a lot of money. That's what makes all this stuff happen or possible. Well, what are the Renaissance trends? I want you to look at this picture for just a moment. I'm even going to dim the lights here for a moment just so you can look at it. So I ask you to focus on it here for a minute. What do you notice immediately when you look at this picture? What stands out to you? Both their heads are covered. Heads are covered, okay. Um, what else? A lot of detail. There's a lot of detail. Any details that capture your attention? Coins. Sure. Coins? Mirror. The reflection of the window. The reflection of the window. Even the illustration of the book. The book has an illustration. The bookshelf in the back. Bookshelves in the back with a lot of stuff on it, right? Okay, maybe that's enough to start with.
But you, you can kind of see also there's there's more space over here. Uh, it's probably going back in. Well, um, this is called, I think I tell you here, the banker and his wife. I mean, that's it's a depiction. So what kinds of ideas do you get from that? There, there's a lot of clues here. Why do you think this this picture came about, this painting came about? I think a guy was just walking down the street. He saw these people said, hey, let me paint your picture. Well, if you wanted your picture painted today, what would you have to do? What's that? Pay for it. Pay for it. Yeah. You would have to get somebody. I mean, there are people who will do it today. You'd have to find out who those people are. And then you'd have to pay them. That's exactly what this is. I call this a Renaissance selfie. Okay? It's like a Renaissance selfie. Why do I call it that? Because as I walk down our, our, our walkway here, what do we call it? El Prado, I see people sometimes taking what are called selfies, right? They get their phone, and they usually hold it up real high, and they look up at it, and people lean, and they, they smile, and you know, they turn it. You know, they, they get it just the right way, and then they take a picture, right? So as you see those selfies, whether they're on Facebook, Instagram, wherever they are, do you feel that they portray reality? I'm just asking. You know, because if, if I just happen to snap their picture, because I've noticed sometimes a second after the picture is gone, the smile is gone, everybody's like, oh, okay, see you later, you know. But in the picture, it's like, hey, we're having a great time. Hey. All right, see you later. Yeah. I think, this, you know, I might be wrong, but it seems to me in the selfie, in the online whatever, people have an image they want to produce project of their life. And for mo many people, they want that to be, you know, you usually don't take a picture of yourself that's unflattering and post it there. You usually don't take a picture of yourself doing mundane things, although I think giving me a picture of your lunch is kind of mundane, but people do that because they think it's a great lunch or something. So look at this hamburger I'm about to eat. I'm really happy for you. You know, I like hamburgers. It doesn't do me much good because you didn't give me any hamburger, right? So, but anyway, or I'm at, this, I'm at this great place. So if you go through and look at that, it gives you a kind of view of that person that's idealized. They're happy. They're exciting. They're doing fun things, you know. All right. Maybe not. I mean, so, some people post things on there I can't believe they post, but that's, <laughs> that's different. But... But this is a kind of selfie. That is, this is orchestrated. Everything, I submit to you that everything in that painting is not there by accident. Everything that's in that painting is there for a reason. And we don't have enough time to go through all of it. But it gives us a good window into Renaissance living. So you notice the hats. And, if, you know, probably don't know enough about the clothes. But the clothes that they are wearing are very expensive for this period. These are expensive clothes. These are not the clothes of workers. These are not the clothes. These are clothes of wealthy people. First thing. Second thing is somebody noticed it right away is the reflection here in this uh, in this glass domed object, right, which is probably could be a picture frame or a mirror or something. But why is it there? It's put there so that you know that they are on the ground floor and that they have a window, which was expensive. That's the most expensive place to live would be on the ground floor. The most expensive place to live would have nice windows like this has. And you can see out and you can even see trees and stuff that are outside. So, you know, these are people who have an estate. These are people that have some land. They're not crowded in some little apartment somewhere. And they're wearing wealthy clothes. And look at this guy. He's counting money. He's got 
Lots of money. So much so it's just sort of laying there, just piles of it. A lot of it looks like gold. Matter of fact, most of it's gold. You know, and one of those gold coins, what that guy has there would be probably the equivalent, at least, of a year's wages for most people. And he's just casually counting it. What does that tell me? Well, it's sending a message. This guy's got plenty of money. He's got so much money, he doesn't even know how much he has. A lot of times, people who don't have much money, I'll tell you one thing I know, is how much they got. I can't buy that, you know. It's... <laughs> That's $5.23. I've only got $4.85. Most people have a lot of money, don't know exactly how much money they're carrying with them or whatever. They don't, they, they don't you know, because why? Because it's not, a, you know, it doesn't matter. Okay, is that going to be 100 bucks? Okay, here's 100 bucks. 150 bucks? Okay, here's 150 bucks. But a person that doesn't have much money keeps track of what they have. Of course, this is in the day before credit cards. Now, what credit cards let you do is Unfortunately, I suppose, or maybe some people say fortunately, they let you buy things that you cannot afford and may have no way of ever paying for. <laughs> but you can get them, and then you're going to owe, owe somebody for, well, for years. Right? Credit card company wants you to pay them every month for the rest of your life. They would be happy because they like that idea. Anyway, so they got plenty of money. They're wearing rich clothes. They got a window, they're in a nice house. Look at that desk or what in front of them. It's got a cover on it. And then look at her. She's just flipping through that book like it's a magazine. Like I've seen people do, say at the airport, they go and buy a magazine and just kind of flip through it, passing the time. And it has color, color illustration. That might bypass us now, but color illustrations are, I mean, books are extremely expensive. And books with color illustrations, very expensive. And then look up on her shelf, they got more books. See, they're showing off their wealth on the shelves as well. We got so much stuff, we need shelves to put it on. We got books, we got gold objects, we got pieces of art in our house. Right? Anyway, much more we could say there, but this is a change of attitude. The attitude of the Renaissance period is wealth and you display your wealth, right? You are not modest about things. You're not holding back. You're saying, this is, you know, this is what I have and here. I'm, I'm not only gonna let you see it, I'm gonna make sure you know. And these people undoubtedly hired somebody to paint this painting, and they orchestrated everything in it because they were going to then hang this up in the entryway to their house or something. So when you would come in, there would be no doubt that you would know they are wealthy people with lots of stuff. So wealthy they could get somebody to come paint them. So wealthy they could be wearing fancy clothes. So wealthy they've got illustrated books and piles of money. Much like, I submit to you, like some selfies. People want to take their picture, and they take their picture out in their driveway in an old beat-up car. They take a picture, you know, on vacation in front of a monument or something, something exciting, something expensive, something, you know, look at me. It's almost like, look at me, ha-ha, I'm having fun, not you. Oh, yeah, wish you were here. <laughs> Well, anyway, this is what people used to do to me before I lived in Florida, who did live in Florida and places like that. They would, they would make sure they contacted me when they saw... It. People live in Florida keep track of the weather elsewhere in the winter so that they can then... Con I don't know, have you, have you experienced this? So you can contact people, like we just... They got a cold front up there, and they'll say, oh, it's like, you know, 10 degrees or something, and they'll say... Oh, yeah, it's very cold here, too, in Florida. It's only going to be 75 today. Have you ever done that? Are you guilty? Call them up, put it on your whatever, Instagram, whatever. I saw, I saw a picture somebody put, and it said, uh, Icy Roads in South Florida. And it had uh, like, a, like a plastic tumbler that had tipped over and ice had spilled out of the glass. You know, it's on the road. And they had a picture of it. This is how, this is our icy roads, right? Stuff like that. All right. So, I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of bragging. It's 
sort of like, ha ha, look at me, you know, I'm in Disney World and you're not. I'm at Epcot Center. I, you know, oh yeah, I'm here for the opening day of this. I went to this. You're not here. Too bad. I wish you were here. Blah, blah, blah. But the main thing is to let you know what I, what exciting life I have. Well, not me, but I mean these people. All right. So humanistic values, individualism, which means they're not worried about humility, which would have been the word that would have described things in the medieval period. Powerful leaders and social classes beginning to break down. A rise of a middle class or the bourgeois. That's who these people are. These people are technically, if we're going to use the thing, they would be peasants. But they want to make sure you know we're no peasants. Peasants don't have a pile of money like this. Peasants don't have illustrated books. Peasants don't wear these kind of clothes. But you see, they're in that sort of peasant category. But now they're wealthy peasants. And so they're not really peasants anymore. They're not the upper class. They're not nobility because they don't have that kind of background, pedigree. But they're not like a guy that's out working in the fields either. And so this is where we see the emergence of a middle class, wealthy. Somebody who's a banker, somebody has a business or something. They've made a lot of money, but they don't have the family connections to be considered nobility. Okay? All right. And, of course, we also have great art. So these are just some of Renaissance trends. Being an individual, having very powerful leaders, breakdown of social classes, and, of course, amazing artwork and architecture. So the princes then, the princes of this period, uh, really bring about a lot of the change. There's a lot of money in Italy, and it's making that money off of trade. Money off of the trade. Um, but the prince who runs the city-state, and really what we see in Italy are city-states, that's what we're going to talk about next, they run it like their own little kingdom, like their own little principality. They are a prince, and they run it that way. But the prince then has to be willing and able and capable of doing a wide variety of things. They have to be a political leader, yes. They have to be an economic leader, yes. They have to be involved in intellectual things, yes. They have to be involved with the military, yes. They have to be like a tycoon or banker, yes. And they're also patrons of the art. This one person is doing, inspiring, and doing, and interested in all of these things. This is where we get the idea of a Renaissance man. You ever heard of that phrase, a Renaissance man? What does a Renaissance man mean? Anybody know? If you are a renaissance man? A jack of all trades. That's a good way to put it. Somebody that is interested and can do a lot of different things. Yeah. That's true. And uh, also, a renaissance man means, you know, what, what we do in our modern society, what we value today is somebody that knows a whole lot about a very narrow field, right? So there, so you say, well, who are you? Are you a, are, well, I, you don't say, well, I'm a biologist. No, that's not good. Well, what kind of biologist are you? Well, I'm a, I'm a microbiologist. What kind of microbiologist? And you keep defining it, defining it, defining it until you get down to a very specific topic in biology that you are an expert on, and that's what would be highly valued. Somebody who has uh, all this knowledge about a very narrow thing. Renaissance man would be just the opposite. Somebody who knows quite a bit about a whole lot of stuff. But today, we value people that know a whole lot about very small areas. So that so, some person has said that people now come to know more and more about less and less until they know absolutely everything about nothing. Maybe that's an exaggeration. But that's what I'm talking about. If you're interested in, capable in, business, art, uh, religion, things like that. We don't usually find people like that. There, there, I don't want to say there's none. But that's not, and it's not even as valued today. People don't value a well-rounded education even today at a college. 
colleges, universities, people are getting away from that. They don't want that. They want to come to a university to be trained for a specific job. And they say, well, why do I have to take this course? If it's not specific training for a specific job that I want, then I shouldn't have to take that course. I mean, that's sort of where people are at today. All right, that's just the opposite of this. You have somebody who's a tycoon banker, who's also a military general, who's also a patron of the arts. Well, this is then divided into various Italian city-states. That's where all this is gonna take place. And we're only gonna look at five of them quickly. And here they are, here's a map of them. You see they're in the northern part of Italy. You got Florence, you got Venice, uh, you've got Milan, and you've got uh, Naples. Now Naples isn't on this map, it's a little further south. And, but you also have the Papal States, which is Rome. So most of them are in the north, although we will include Naples briefly. Uh, but they are there. Now, you, when you think of the Italian city-states, you should think of them as like their own tiny little countries. They are principalities, and they operate independently. So in an Italian city-state, each city-state operates much like the ancient Greek city, like when we talked about Athens and Sparta and Corinth and so forth, how they had their own thing going on. These are all sovereign powers they have their own. Um, they have their own way of doing things, right? They have their own ambassadors. They have their own alliances. They make their own military and economic alliances, and they all compete with one another. So Rome is going to compete with uh, Venice, with Milan, with Florence. They compete with one another. I mean, you can really see this competition when it comes to art. They try to have the best art. They also try to have the best artist. They would actually go out and recruit the best artist to come to their city. They would offer the artist money, you know, place to stay, access, notoriety. If you come down here to Rome, you know, and of course, the Pope in Rome has a lot of influence because he can also leverage uh, spiritual things there. But the competition then breeds the, um, drives them doing more and more and more. I don't know where you stand on competition, but I think competition makes people work harder. That's what I think. <laughs> some, some people are opposed to competition, but I think competition actually uh, helps bring out the best in people rather than the worst. You'll have to decide for yourself. But I think here, competition is certainly a part of it and how these cities drive themselves to be the best city, to have the best art, to have the best architecture, to have the best economy. Well, another thing that happens during this period is the decline of the papacy. We haven't talked a lot about the papacy in here. We've mentioned it. We mentioned it during the Crusades and so forth. The papacy had gotten very strong, let's say, during the Crusades, just after the Crusades, the papacy or the Bishop of Rome had assumed the mantle of control of all the church in the West. And what we see happens, and again, you might say it's a cliche, but I think it has value. I think it has, when you say, power corrupts, right? You heard that? Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. There's another saying for you. Well, I think the saying has merit. The more power somebody has, the more likely they will abuse it. Right? Just, it's kind of human nature, I guess, or the temptation would be, if I'm in charge, nobody is watching sort of over me, I can do what I wish, and so I will. Well, the Pope begins to take more and more, assume more and more power, and this then leads to corruption within the papacy. So one of the places where this intersection between powerful people comes with the papacy under Boniface VIII. You see when he's, he's the Pope there uh, towards the end of the 12, 1200s, and he's in dispute with Philip IV, who's the king of France. 
You remember I introduced to you back in the medieval thing, I said that when Charlemagne was crowned emperor by the Pope, you remember? Uh, the, the papacy is going to think they have the most power, but the kings, the emperors and stuff are going to think they have the most power. Well, this is one of those examples. Here's Philip on a horseback. Again, I'm sure another painting that was staged that he had paid for <laughs> that portrays him in his regal outfit with a regal horse in a regal position. Nothing by accident there. Well, one of the things that Philip wanted to do is tax the clergy. Taxing the clergy had never happened. Why? Because the clergy were separate from the rest of the people. The church had its own structure, its own monetary structure, its own laws, everything. I mean, if a clergyman got in trouble, if a priest or something got, they wouldn't be tried in a regular court. They would be taken to the church court, so to speak, the ecclesiastical court, and uh, also taxing. We still have this today, and there are people who I believe are candidates for president right now <laughs> who want to begin taxing churches. Because one thing that churches don't have to do is pay taxes. You can have a church that's got big acres and acres of land right near an interstate. They don't pay one penny in property tax. And they can have all kinds of things going on there, a school, daycare, gift shops, I don't know. A lot of these big churches have, have all kinds of things. And none of it is taxed. And so a lot of people are looking at ways that we want to get more money. Well, here's a way we can do it. We'll tax the churches. Give them property tax, give them taxes on all the things they do. Uh, you know, ministers, ordained ministers get a tax benefit that no one else gets. Did you know that? It's called a housing allowance. I get a housing allowance. That means I don't pay taxes on a big chunk of what I get paid because ministers get a special deal. So you can, anything, anything that it costs for you to have, run, or, or, uh, or maintain your house, you don't have to pay taxes on. So that means your mortgage payments, you know, or rent payments, or uh, utilities, uh, repairs. Is that just for Florida? No, all across the United States, there is, uh, there is a tax exemption for ministers for housing allowances, if they're ordained ministers. So you have to file that paperwork. And then, you know, now that's if, that's if you're actually doing a job related to ministry. Right? So working here, since this is a Christian college, it qualifies. So I'm a minister. I'm ordained. I work at a Christian college. I help to train ministers. Not every person I do, but a lot of them. And are going to be working in churches. So that's part of my job. So that's a benefit. Well, where does that idea come from? It's a very old one. It goes all the way back to medieval times that you could not tax clergy. Well, what Philip started to do, he says, I'm going to tax the clergy. And the Pope says, no way. Can you do that? That's not allowed. That's never been done. Um, saying, look, you know, part of it was because all the income that, uh, say, clergy had came from the church. So if you're taxing the clergy, you're really taxing the church. And taxing the church uh, was considered to be wrong because the church is above the state. The church is connected to God. The church is not connected to the government. Well, anyway, he issues a papal bull. Now, papal bull is not an animal. Papal bull is a document, okay? They normally name the document by the first two words of the document. So this is called the Unum Sanctum of 1302, where basically the Pope declares papal authority not, it's not just about taxes. says, i got papal authority over the state. So a king can't tax the church. In fact, the king is subject to, to the church. The church is above the state. Well, the king doesn't like that idea. As you might imagine, troubles begin to grow, and we see that eventually 
um, the king is going to come down and try to settle this. How does he do that? Well, he brings some troops with him. Uh, Boniface will eventually excommunicate Philip. Philip will send his troops, and they just capture the pope. Now, later the pope will be freed by Italian nobles, but it is said that the shock of this, if you take a look at the, at the period of this pope, it's very short, that this got the pope so upset that he died. He died because... Uh, you know, maybe a heart attack, stress, whatever, that, that this fighting with the king and the king arrests him. And, you know, I don't know if you've ever known people who get very upset about certain things. You can, if you get very upset about things, have a heart attack, have a stroke, blood pressure. When you say your blood pressure goes up, that can create a lot of problems. And so that's what happens. The pope then dies. So guess what? We need a new pope. So what's going to happen? This is going to usher in a period where we got a lot of pope problems, right? Problems with the pope, pope problems, papacy, papacy problems, <laughs> something like that. We have a purveyance of papacy problems. The papacy was in peril? Yes, a period of papal peril. A period of papal peril <laughs> brought about by... Uh, well, well, we'll keep working on it. All right, so we need a new pope. You can't not have a pope, so let's get a new pope. Well, you know what? Philip already got his troops down there. Philip, obviously a man who wants to be in charge, he pressures the College of Cardinals. You know who the College of Cardinals are? They're the next layer of church authority, right? You got the pope, then you got this group of cardinals. And typically, I think exclusively, the papacy comes from the College of Cardinals. So when they're looking for a new pope, they just don't go stop a guy on the street and say, hey, you're going to be the new pope. <laughs> they go to that College of Cardinals and they say, one of these college, one of these cardinals in the College of Cardinals will be the next pope. Well, those college, the College of Cardinals has popes in there, popes, has cardinals in there who are Italian, French, probably German. You know, they're from different backgrounds. But always it had been an Italian pope. Until just recently, that's still the case. We now have an Argentinian pope. And before that, we had a German pope. And before that, we had a Polish pope. But if you go back and take a look at uh, most of the popes before that period, popes before that period, there was a propensity of popes in that period That were Italian. I, know I can't make Italians into a P, but anyway, uh, the, most of them have been Italian. You go down, you take a whole list of all the popes and find out where they're from. Like 90, probably 98% of them, 95% of them have been Italians. That's their background, right? All right. This time, he pressures them to elect somebody who's French to be the next pope. Take a cardinal who's French and elect him. Why? Well, because the king's French. <laughs> and if I has a French pope, guess what? The French pope's not going to give me a hard time because I'm the French king. He's a French pope, and uh, he's going to know which side his bread is buttered on. You know what I mean by that? If you butter the bread, you want to hold the bread by the side that doesn't have the butter on it, right? You don't put it face down, and your hand gets all greasy. You want it the other way so you can eat the bread. Well... He's going to know which side the bread, bed is the bed. The bread is buttered on. Now we're going from peas to bees. And, uh, and so then he not only does that, but they move the papacy away from Rome. What? Yes, they move it to a place called Avignon. And Avignon is in the southern part of France. And this is where the papacy is going to be. And the papacy now comes under the control of the French kings. And then, of course, the, pa the pope gets to... Uh, sort of pick who would be the next, the Pope picks who will be the next car cardinals who will then become the next popes. And he begins to pick all French guys, pretty much all French guys start to be loaded up on the College of Cardinals. Does this make sense? So it's a way in which the French take over the papacy, and this king has orchestrated it. 
This period has sometimes been called um, the, the French capture, the French uh, takeover of the papacy. So what that then means is that some people down in Italy are not very happy. Can you imagine that? We're not happy. They say this is not the way it should be. This is now the papacy has become a political thing, right? And the king has inserted himself into this process when he's not supposed to insert himself into this process. And we see that now the French control it. So the Italians are not very happy with that. So what are they going to do? Yes? What are they going to do? Well, uh, they're going to wait, not too patiently, and then one of these French popes by the name of Gregory X, Gregory X, will be down in Rome. Now, occasionally the French pope would come to Rome for certain activities, certain things. He happens to be in Rome, and guess what? He dies in Rome. Was it an accident? Well, most people say it was. I don't know. Anyway, he dies in Rome, and guess what? This is a time when the Italians say, okay, we're taking this thing back. And so the people of Rome then force the College of Cardinals who have come with the Pope to, to select a Pope who is Italian, Roman, somebody from, from the area. And so they elect Urban. You take, you know, these Popes take a name when they become Pope. He takes the name Urban VI. Urban VI becomes the Pope. Guess what? Back in France, they said, that's not right. You can't just do that. You guys took over this. Of course, they had done it earlier. So five months later, they elect a French pope. So what happens? Now we got a French pope? No. Guess what? We got Clement VII. They declare that Urban's was null and void. So how is this resolved? The way most people resolve their problems, they don't. So what do we have? We got two popes. Now we got two popes. We got a, what we might call the French pope and the Italian pope. Now, to the regular person out there, the regular Joe and Josephine or whatever, uh, you know, who goes to church, they're peasants or whatever, they don't know a lot about all the politics. They don't know a lot about all this. But there's a couple of things that they know. Here's one thing. There's only supposed to be one pope. That's one thing they know. And the Pope's supposed to be in Rome. Those are two things that they know. And now we got two Popes, and we've had a Pope for a long time not in Rome. The Pope's in France. What's the Pope doing in France? Something just doesn't seem right. Well, we got two Popes. We got Urban VI in Rome, and we got Clement VII in Avignon. This is sometimes called the Great Schism. The Great Schism of the Western Church is the fact that you've divided, you've, that's what a schism is, you've divided the papacy, you've kind of divided the church. And so guess what? People start to choose their favorite pope. You've never had this chance before to choose Whatever pope you want, right? You, well, which one do I like? And what happens is, sort of by countries, they pick which pope they'll follow. And, of course, they're mainly going to choose a pope, not based on some spiritual thing that says, well, we really think that spiritually this guy is the most spiritual pope. We're going to follow him. Or, well, you know, that other, that other person became pope. That really wasn't a, a spiritual way to do it. We should do it this no, they're mainly choosing which pope they want to follow based on politics. For example, I'm going to give you, I think I've got a chart here that I slaved over that I'm going to show you now. You know how my charts are. They're very elaborate. Well, mostly the leaders. You know, they had kings and stuff, and a king would say, okay, if I get a choice, this is what I'm choosing. Well, for example, if you're the leader in England, do you think you want to have follow a French pope? No. You don't like the French. <laughs> you don't want a French pope. Now you got a chance. There it is. So, remember, the blue guy is the French pope. 
The red guy is the Italian pope. Why did I choose that? I don't know. It has no significance other than just to delineate it. And so here is Urban. He's in Rome. He's the Italian pope. Here's Clement. He's in Avignon. He's a French pope. So you would assume France would go with the French pope, and they do. That makes sense, right? If France, if there's a French pope, guess what? England does not want anything to do with France normally, so they choose the Italian pope, the Roman pope. Scotland almost always goes with France. Why? Because Scotland doesn't like England, if, if you noticed. <laughs> and so they say, well, we're not going to go with the Roman Pope. We're going to go with the French Pope, because especially because the English are going with the Roman, the Roman Pope. And you might think all of Italy would go with the Italian Pope, but no, you'd be wrong. Uh, Southern Italy had always been wanting to be independent of the rest of Italy. They will actually go with the French Pope while the rest of Italy goes with the Italian Pope. <sighs> then we got Germany and Scandinavia. They're more traditional. They're going with the Roman Pope. And Spain goes with the French Pope. So now this great schism becomes pretty well known, and it lasts for a while. See this? We got two popes for, what is that, 40 years almost? got the Leaning Tower of Pisa. That's not the Leaning Tower of Pizza, as I've heard some people call it. If you want a Leaning Tower of Pizza, you got to come to my house December the 6th. I don't know if there will be a tower, but there will be pizza. It'd be kind of messy. I, think I, could, I guess I could just stack pizzas up on each other. And a cake stand. Oh, yeah, I guess you could do that. Well, anyway... The Great Schism, and I put this up here because it will, they will try to resolve it at Pisa. Well, one thing this does, like I said, is it weakens people's faith. Because whether they know a lot about church politics or not, like I said, they know there's only supposed to be one pope. And most of them would say, where should the pope be? They'd probably say Rome. But here we got a pope in two places, and now we got people picking sides and everybody starts to say, you know what, this just doesn't seem right. This doesn't seem spiritual enough uh, to me. Right? You can see how that would be, even if you weren't well attuned to all the details. Well, guess what? The Council of Pisa in 1409, they get together in the town of Pisa with this leaning tower. And they make a decision. They say, you know what we're going to do? We're going to get rid of both the popes. We're going to get, we're going to depose, we're going to say neither one of those popes is pope, the Italian one, the French one, and we're going to pick a new pope, and this new pope's going to be the real pope. So they elected a new pope. Guess what happens? The other two popes say, we're not following what you say. We're not stepping down. And so now we have, for a while here, for a few years, we're going to have three popes. We'll have the, the Roman Pope, we'll have the, the uh, French Pope, and then we'll have the new Pope that was just picked, the new Pope that was picked in Pisa. Oh, a lot of Ps there. The papal Pope of Pisa that was picked will now have three Popes. Now, that won't last for too long. It will be addressed at the Council of Constance, they say, look, we got to do something about it. And they finally do resolve it at the Council of Constance in 1414 to 1418. This is a long, protracted meeting of church leaders who elect a new pope from Rome, and the other three are deposed, and it, they actually are deposed. So we go back to having one pope in Rome. All right. And, you know, whether, whether, you, whether you're big into that or not, you're just happy that there's not so many names to remember, because you only have one pope now. But while they're there at the Council of Constance, they also are addressing other issues. Those other issues are corruption. Hey, did that sign-in sheet make its way around? You got it? Why don't you pass it on over here, and I'll pick it up. Well, one of the things that they're going to address is corruption and false teaching, heresy. Corruption and heresy. One of the guys that will come on their target, be a target for them, 
is a guy named John Huss, or perhaps to be more correct to call him Jan Hus. Well, you can say it either way, I guess. John Huss uh, lived in Prague, what would have one time been Czechoslovakia or the Czech, now the Czech Republic. He was the chancellor of the University of Prague. He was a church leader, because remember, all the universities are controlled by the clergy and their training clergy. But he had criticized the practices of the church. He said, there's a lot of corruption in the church. And he was saying, the papacy has become corrupt. And one of the things that he focuses in on are the sale of indulgences. Anybody know what an indulgence is? This will lead us into our discussion that we will have not next week, but the week after Thanksgiving. Isn't that something that like, forgives your sins? Yes. It's a document. Yeah. You, paid, you paid money for it, and then you insert the name of someone uh, that, well, basically Roman Catholics believe that when you die, even if you're a good Roman Catholic, you're not going straight to heaven. There was a place called Purgatory. Purgatory was a place where you sort of worked out the sins, the punishment for the sins that you had committed that you had never repented of, you'd never done. So, for example, what you were supposed to do if you're a good Roman Catholic is go to church every week, and before you took the Mass, before you took the communion, right, the Eucharist, you were supposed to confess your sins. You're supposed to go to the confessional. That's usually on a Saturday night. Saturday, you go in and confess your sins, and then you were given penance of something you were supposed to do. Like if you had done something, you're supposed to go and ask forgiveness or, uh, you know, say so many Our Fathers, so many Hail Marys, so many whatever, to show that you were sorry for your sins. Penance. Now what happens is a lot of people don't make it there every week, right? Or if they go to confession, they don't confess everything. There's just some things they don't want to confess. Or they confess it, and then they say, okay, here's what you should do, and then they don't do those things. Any one of those things would mean that when you died, you still had uh, to show you were sorry for your sins, that you had truly repented. And so that's what purgatory was about. Purgatory was a place that was uncomfortable, a place of punishment. And then you spent a certain amount of time there, depending on how much bad stuff you hadn't taken care of. And then you would go to heaven. So everybody who went to purgatory was going to heaven eventually. Purgatory is not hell. They're not the same. And purgatory doesn't lead anyone to hell. Purgatory is always leading people to heaven. Anyway, the idea here was is that when you died, unless you were a saint, you weren't going straight to heaven. And, you know, your grandmother, you might have loved her, but you know she wasn't a saint. She, did, she said some things. She did some things she shouldn't have done. And so now, Granny is in purgatory. And so what can you do to help? You know, she made you all those nice, warm cookies. I'm hoping chocolate chip. And, uh, and she was very nice. She loved you, and you loved her. What can you do for Granny? And here's one thing you can do. You can buy Granny an indulgence. You can get her out of purgatory right now. That's something she can't do for herself. This is a gift that keeps on giving. And so you go, you have the document is there, they put her name in, they put your name in, you pay the fee, they go through the thing, boom, granny's out of purgatory. That's an indulgence. John Huss didn't like that practice. Neither will Martin Luther later on. Well, John Huss gets invited to the Council of Constance. And so he thought, well, this is great. They're finally going to listen to me. All the church leaders are there. I can come and explain what I'm talking about. I'm sure if they hear what I talk about, they're going to agree, and we can actually make some progress here. John Huss's problem was he thought that meetings were going to go his way and that they were good things. <laughs> and I've known from in my own experience, meetings are generally not good things. If somebody wants to have a meeting with me, it's not a good thing for me. That's usually been my experience. Uh, hopefully someone will prove me wrong soon. Anyway, um, so he gets called to the council, and he comes prepared. He's, he's excited to share his views and thinks they're going to listen to me. And as soon as he arrives in the town of Constance, which is sort of in between, um, that's on the south side of Germany, not far from Austria, 
Anyway, he's arrested. I mean, it's a beautiful place to go and nice lakes there and stuff. But they arrest him and they condemn him and they put him on trial and they find him guilty of being a heretic and they burn him at the stake. That's what this artwork is here. John Huss being burned at the stake. This leads to civil wars in what would be the Czech Republic today, uh, or Bohemia, as it was sometimes called. These are called the Hussite Wars. Hussite Wars. All right? I bring that up because I'm showing how the church's power is there, how they're addressing corruption. They don't want outside... Well, he wasn't technically he was outside, but they don't, they, don't, they don't take criticism well, right? And a guy named Martin Luther is going to have much the same things to say, but it's going to have a different outcome, and we'll talk about that more later. So that brings us then to the Renaissance papacy. The Renaissance papacy, one of the corruptions that it has is called nepotism. Anybody know what nepotism is? What is nepotism? Ever heard that word? Or give me an example of it. Like when people are in power, they kind of like favor friends and stuff. They favor friends, and, and really the, the word originates, they favor relatives. 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 But also, yeah. Well, it actually comes from the Latin word for nephew. Nephos means nephew, or that's where we get the root for nephew. So basically, where this word, well, I'll give you an example. I used to work at a grocery store when I was in college. For four years I was in college, I worked in the meat department of a grocery store, right? And I remember I worked there full time in the summer and I worked there part time during the school year. And I'd work during all my holiday breaks Christmas, Thanksgiving, whatever time I would go there and I'd work, all right? So I'd worked there for three years or so, done quite a bit of work. And I remember one day, the manager of the store uh, came to me and he said, hey, uh, Jeff here is uh, going to come work in the meat department. I want you to train him how to do everything. He doesn't know the meat department. I want you to train how we do things, how, how all the procedures are. And oh, by the way, Jeff is your boss. <laughs> Jeff was his nephew. the son of the guy that owned the store. And the guy who was the manager of the store was the son of the guy who owned the store. And so Jeff was now my boss, um, and he later went on and was ran the whole store. But that was after me. So I trained Jeff in meat department anyway. Uh, Jeff was getting paid more than me. Jeff was, has authority over me. Why? Jeff did not know the job, but I had to train him. So you might say, well, that's not fair. But that's nepotism, and that happens a lot. That's just one example. Now, this comes from the idea of nephew, and it really comes back to the Renaissance, this period, because remember, I don't know if we, we haven't talked about this a lot, but the popes are not supposed to have girlfriends, and the popes are not supposed to have wives. Ergo, the popes are not supposed to have children, because if you don't have a girlfriend or a wife, pretty hard to have a child, Right? If you're a pope. But guess what? Some popes did have children. Now, when these children would show up, much like Jeff, the pope would make them cardinals. He would advance them in the church. So that it came to the point where there were a lot of cardinals and other people around the church who looked a lot like the pope. And when somebody asks about it, they say, well, no, that's not my son. That is my brother's son. That's my nephew. That's my sister's son or whatever. These are my nephews. So nephews were often appointed to be cardinals. For example, Sixtus, Sixtus the Fourth, not to be confused with Fourthus the Sixth. There was no Fourthus the Sixth. But anyway, he appointed five nephews as cardinals, and they're in this painting. I don't know if you can see it here. That's why I put the painting up here. Here's the Pope. One, two, three, four, five. There are his nephews. They all kind of look alike. 
And they all kind of look like him. And that's because they're all brothers, and that's their father. But the Pope's not supposed to have sons. But the Pope has a lot of nephews, and the nephews become powerful. All right? As part of the corruption of the papacy, the Pope is doing stuff that a Pope's not supposed to do, like have sons. All right? It's not a biology class, so I won't explain to you how that happens. But you might know already. Well, then there's Alexander the Sixth. Alexander the Sixth, or Alexander Borgia. If we had a most corrupt pope contest, this guy would have to probably win. He'd certainly be in the top two or three. <laughs> this guy was pretty corrupt. He had lots of mistresses. In the Vatican, there were orgies. He made one son and a nephew cardinals, and he begins to buy and sell church offices and other favors from the church. The way part of this would happen is the, um, let's say a bishop dies or something in Germany somewhere, right? Let's just say Munich, the bishop dies. Guess what? There's a lot of nobility up there that would like to see their son become the next bishop. So they approach the church, they approach the pope, and they say, hey, you know, we would like our son here to be the next bishop. And the pope says, well, that perhaps could be arranged. But I have other people that want their sons to be the bishop. I mean, what? how would you, might you encourage me? How, how about a donation to the church to encourage this appointment? And so they would, and then it would be kind of bidding. And then the one who won, who paid the most, their son would become the next bishop. Right? And other things, like, you know, we want this to happen in our area. The Pope says, well, that could happen in your area. But, you know, how about a donation to the church? It's like people say, hey, I want to pass this class. And, well, you could pass this class. But how about a donation? to my retirement fund. Stuff like that. That's illegal. We can't do that. I'm not suggesting that you do that. <laughs> Just an example. Just an example. All right. So there we go. So this is Alexander. But here's another one. Julius II. He's sometimes called the warrior pope. We may not think of popes going out into battle, right? That's not what a pope does. A pope's supposed to be doing the mass and doing spiritual stuff. But no. Remember, they are Renaissance princes. He led troops into battle. He's the one who began the building of St. Peter's Basilica, the largest church building, still the largest church building in the world. He commissions a guy named Michelangelo. You might have heard of him. He's one of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Michelangelo to paint the Pope's private prayer chapel. The Pope has a private prayer chapel called the Sistine Chapel. Not to be confused with the 15th Chapel, which he didn't use that way. Well, the Sistine Chapel is going to take, it's going to take Michelangelo four years to paint it. It's over 6,000 square feet. And Michelangelo says, look, Pope, uh, I'm not a painter. Michelangelo never said he was a painter. He was a sculptor. He liked to sculpt things out of marble. But the Pope wanted him to paint this. And so guess what? Michelangelo did it. Okay? Six, over 6,000 square feet. Here is a picture of that. Oh, this is a little more about Michelangelo. These, this is what he liked to do. These are his sculptures. Two of his famous ones. This one is Moses. It's in a different church, not in St. Peter's Basilica, but it's in Rome. Notice that Moses has horns because he read in the Bible, it said when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, he had horns. Well, you can look that up in the King James or something anyway. That, that's sort of there. That's why he put that there. There he is with the tablets. And here is the Pieta. Very famous. This is in St. Peter's Basilica. When you come in, it's on the right-hand side. They have bulletproof glass in front of it now because a guy came in there with a hammer and started pounding on it. Started knocking off the, you know, the legs and stuff. But this is, the Pieta is of Mary holding Jesus when he comes down from the cross. But, of course, they've got Jesus 
sort of elongated, so he really, you know, is the centerpiece of this. Anyway, there's a lot more you could say about it. But these are two things Michelangelo did. But what he wanted Michelangelo to do was to paint the inside of his private chapel, which is called the Sistine Chapel. So take a look at this. That's a lot of painting. See why it took him years to do it. And especially the ceiling, but he also did these ends. By the way, this end is a, is a picture of judgment, painting of judgment, you know, with the sheep and the goats, the left and the right. Guess who's on the side that's going to go to, to hell? One of the cardinals that Michelangelo didn't like. He painted a guy that looked a lot like him there. But then the famous parts are up here on the ceiling. These are different scenes from the Bible. This most One of the most famous ones is creation, right up here. So here is that ceiling. Take a look at that. It's been restored, say, in the past 15, 20 years, and they've cleaned it so you can really see it much better. But he painted all these panels with different stories, different scenes. But here is the creation one. Now, of course, you are a long ways down. You cannot see this detail, but Mike, it made no difference to Michelangelo. He painted it in a very elaborate way. This is God reaching down and touching Adam. God and the angels, you know, touching Adam. All right. Michelangelo. Next book we'll talk about is Leo X. Great patron of the arts. Here you see Leo with a couple of his cardinals. Do you notice the resemblance? Yeah, you should. There are a couple of his nephews. <laughs> he commissioned Raphael, that other turtle, and this time to do paintings for the Vatican Palace, including, I believe, this painting, this portrait, I think was done by Raphael. I'd have to double check that. With his two favorite cardinals that are his nephews, Kind of a family portrait. All right. That's Leo X. Here's one of Raphael's paintings of the crucifixion. Well, let's, we've, we've talked about the Papal States. Let's talk about Florence quickly. Florence, another one of these cities. And here is another statue of Michelangelo. Michelangelo carved... David. This is probably one of his most famous, maybe his most famous statue. David doesn't look very Jewish to me. Does he look like a Jewish, you know, like a shepherd boy? No, he looks like a Greek god. And that's on purpose. Michelangelo does not apologize for it. You can go see this in Florence. Um, Florence had the Arno River, center of banking and commerce. The family that kind of ran the city was called the de Medici's. They had an oligarchy, that's the rule of a few. And two of the most important of the de Medici's at this period was Cosimo de Medici and Lorenzo de Medici. Which, by the way, Lorenzo had the nickname Il Magnifico. Which I guess if you can get that, mag <laughs> you can get that kind of nickname, go for it. The Magnificent One, the Great One, or whatever. So that's one of the cities. So remember, we've got Rome, or the Papal States. You've got Florence there. Then, of course, you've got Venice. Venice in the news this morning because they've got a flood there in, in Venice. Uh, and this building, this square right here is all flooded. Of course, it's right by the water. But they've had a storm, and a lot of water has come into the, the Piazza San Marco. Mark Square, St. Mark Square, and there's a lot of flooding, and there's a church there, and uh, this is also the palace of the leader, the Doge, not the doggy, but the Doge has his palace here. This was the home of the painter Titian, you might have heard about, and Titian has a famous blue paint, Titian blue. Well, then there's Milan, another powerful city, banking on the Po River, ruled by the Sforza family, and of course, home to Leonardo da Vinci, a Renaissance man for sure, into science, painting. Uh, you know, he knew many languages. He, uh, he studied many things. And of course, this is his most famous painting of Mona. And uh, The Last Supper is another one of his famous paintings. 
that's Milan. And remember, each of these cities is trying to get these famous artists to come there. Here is the Last Supper. Well, I want to mention now Machiavelli. Machiavelli is a thinker of this time, and this also shows us the change in thinking in the Renaissance. You might call him a historian, a diplomat, a political science. He is from Florence, but he, he marks a radical change in medieval politics because what he does is he writes a work called The Prince, and this work, The Prince, is a writing in which he gives advice to the prince. And he says, who am I to give? I don't have anything I can give you. You have everything. The only thing I can possibly offer you is my writing, my advice. And so the prince really marks how things have changed. The prince was written in 1513. You might call it realism, political realism. And basically, the prince is saying, don't try to run the government like a Christian organization, Christian values. What is the most important thing for any leader is to keep power. You've already got power. Once you have power, now it's your job to keep power. And basically, he'll say, uh, the prince should do by any means at available to keep their power, to get the desired result. And so this is where we get the saying, the end justifies the means. The end justifies the means. Okay? He'll also say, something that becomes kind of famous, it's better to be feared than to be loved. If you're the leader, it's better if people fear you than love you. Because if they fear you, they'll do what you say. If they love you, they might think they don't have to do what you say. So Machiavelli and Machiavellianism has become a word that means somebody who uh, is uh, doing things to help themselves. Now, we have a couple more screens here, and we still have three minutes, so I know everyone's anxious. Well, let's hang in there. This is our second to the last screen. This one is about some other developments that take place in the Renaissance period. One of the things that happens is the rise of Neoplatonic thought, Neoplatonic philosophy and theology. Plato, you remember the philosopher, we talked about him early in the semester, Greek philosopher. He had the idea that everything, you know, this, this world was uh, uh, the realm of real, but there was another whole other plane of existence, which was the ideal world and that this was just a poor imitation of the real. So the real world for him was not here. The real world for him was out there. And what we are is a poor imitation. Well, some people tried to take Plato and baptize him. That has happened more than once. And sort of make him into Christian thinking. And that's certainly what happens here. Neoplatonic theology, uh, fin Fincio, is going to try to merge Christianity with Plato's thinking, or Platonism. And this has a great impact on, on the church at that time, and that's coming out of this Renaissance period. Now, another major event, and this will be the last event that we'll talk about that comes in this Renaissance period, and that is the idea of printing. By 1500, there are a thousand printers in Europe. The guy who revolutionizes this is in this period, his name is Gutenberg, Johannes, Johann Gutenberg, from Mainz, Germany. He perfects the use of movable, reusable type. And so by 1455 or 1456, he has typeset and printed a Bible. This may not seem like much to us today, but if you had to handwrite everything, and now we typeset it, you can print as many as you want. It takes time to typeset it, a lot of time. But once you do that, now you can print as many copies as you want. Printing becomes the, uh, becomes the major factor here. And in fact, when we approached the year 2000, they did a survey. And they asked historians, 
What is the major event of the past 1,000 years? Think about all the things that happened from 1,000 to 2,000. The number one thing that historians put down that changed the world was movable type and printing presses because that puts the ideas out there for everybody to see and led to lots of change and even revolutions and so forth. All right, we'll end it there for today.